recording. We are, yeah, we're on. Um, yeah, don't say no comment to questions. <laughs> 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 that would be like the shortest, most boring podcast ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't, I've never, I've never had, I've never had that. No comment. No, I've had people who are, they don't answer very thoroughly. They, you know, it's a, Dance around the handbags. So, yeah, yeah. So, how, how, you know, how was that experience for you? Yeah, it's all right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you think, you know, you have to have a conversation that people are going to listen to. Yeah. It. Like, <laughs> it's just like, help me out, help me out. Let's just, we're discussing things. Um, what were we talking before? What were we talking about before? Oh, CBD. Yeah, so the, like, you listened to the Grace Blessed Happily podcast. Yeah. So, one of the things I did when I, when I finished that podcast, so, I've been taking CBD for about a year, mm-hmm. um, which, yeah, regularly for about a year, and it was it, I did what probably most people did. I went online, I saw CBD tablets, yeah, and I thought I'll just buy them and start taking them. And what I realised after speaking to Grace is that that dose is so low when you buy yeah. them, online, it's so low. Uh, you, they, they, they display the doses in a real weird way of strength in a real weird way so they'll say it'll say a bottle of cbd and it'll say 750 milligrams mm-hmm. that's the whole bottle so it's not per tablet you know it's a weird right, way okay. they do it it's, it's not per tablet so you want to look at per tablet and when i the ones i was taking were five milligrams right and i wasn't sure if that was having an impact or not and the impact i was looking for was um calmness yeah i wanted to be a less busy mind i just wanted to be less anxious a bit more calmness and also i was looking to take it for the anti-inflammatory properties so to reduce the niggles and injuries mm-hmm. and pains average and reduce the chance of injury right and reduces the impact of injury as well yeah uh so did that podcast with grace then thought i'm taking way too little uh, I, I should be looking at somewhere between a 25 milligram and 65 75 milligram per tablet or or dose per day as opposed to five milligrams right okay yeah so i went online looking and i found a so she recommended a company um on the podcast but she recommended that company because they they're they're the the purity of the cbd and the chances of having a lot of thc in there yeah. relative um, a lot. We really, they were just really well controlled. And there was very little chance of that. So I didn't go with that company. I found another one because it was quick delivery on Amazon. I don't like waiting around. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it, I started taking twenty five milligrams a day. This one won't say noticeable difference. Okay, that's... like no, no, no in your mind. Oh, is this a placebo? Is it not? And it's like fucking noticeable. Yeah. Like one hundred percent noticeable difference. Much, yeah, I think I'm much calmer. Noticeably calmer. Noticeably less anxious. Uh, and and yeah, they're the two main things, and that's on twenty five twenty five milligrams a day. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm really happy at the minute. In terms, of, so I found that and, and realised that impact. Uh, so people out there, yeah, think about what are you, you know, if you're trying CBD, you're thinking, oh, is it really is it really doing anything for me? I don't know. Look at what you're taking on a daily basis and up it. So I, yeah. you know, like start with twenty five milligrams and then up it from there if you need to, but. Like with anything, there is probably side effects if you start whacking <laughs> 200, 300 milligrams in your body. <laughs> Although I don't know. Uh, Grace would know. No. Um, yeah, so you take it as well? Or you? No, no, I don't take it. No, so, but my, my daughter has oh, taken right, it. Yeah. yeah. Oil. Yeah. yeah. So the oil. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. I've got, a friend who, I've got a friend who takes the oil, but he doesn't. So I asked him what, what dose it is. He doesn't know because. How much is in a drop? Like, yeah. how big should a drop be? He doesn't know. And then my dad has started using CBD. Randomly phoned me yesterday to talk about it. I thought, oh, he must have listened to my last podcast because he listens to the podcast. And he hadn't. Okay. Yeah, and, and I thought, how are you taking it? He said, I'm smoking it. Okay. I'm thinking, <laughs> all right. And he, you know, he, he has been a weed smoker in the past and dealt with the mental stuff mainly. Yeah. Um, uh, but he, so when he explained it to me, he's he's put in, it's the leaf. He's putting it in with, with his okay. backy. Yeah, okay. But he's not getting stoned. He's, I think he's smoking hemp. Right, okay. Cause, so, so you know the difference between hemp and cannabis? Yeah. Oh, okay, right. So for people who aren't aware, hemp doesn't contain THC. Yep. You, hemp has got CBD. It's less potent. It's got CBD. Looks the same as a weed plant. Smells the same as a weed plant. Smokes the same as a weed plant. It's not weed. It's yeah. hemp, but it's got CBD. So, 
That's it, CBD. I think the interesting thing that Grace was mentioning in, in the you know the podcast is the different levels of THC in different products and how that can vary sometimes. Although there is a that, that's controlled as they're well. They're allowed to sell. <coughs> they're allowed. So companies are allowed to sell CBD over you as long as it's at least ninety eight percent pure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, ninety eight percent. So two percent or less THC in it. And with 2% or less THC, you're not going to know. It. So yeah. THC is the thing that gets you high, right? Or, yeah, it's, just, it's, the, it's the psychoactive component, cannabinoid in the cannabis plant. 2% is not going to get you high. Yeah. But the reason she was, well, yeah, you listen to it, the reason she did say it's important is because in their, in their research that they've done, people who, so THC can, would, that is the thing. So if you're in, a, in the military and you're getting drugs tested, mm -hmm. when people get caught for cannabis in, in the military, they get it's THC they're getting caught for. Yeah, they're being tested for the the, the Thai whatever blah 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 cannabinoid THC. Yeah. So if you if you're taking CBD on a regular basis, and it's got maybe two percent THC in it, which you can legally buy over the counter the CBD, then she was saying in their research they've seen that that can build up in people those two percent over time. Yeah. And over time you could get to a a level of THC in your system whereby you would fail a drugs test if you were drugs tested, even though you're not smoking weed. But it would look like yeah. you had been. Yeah. That's that's the point on the 98%, yeah. Yeah, so that kind of, you know, I suppose, blew me away a bit when she mentioned that because I would imagine that, you know, just uh, you know, just people just generally up, up taking use of CBD has been considerable, particularly, I would imagine, after pandemic or through the pandemic after the pandemic you know that uh it's become more prevalent in use do you know what I mean you could get into that trap do you know what I mean uh, yeah well this is this is why I like having the conversation and this conversation we have right now because it's that not knowledge of it is important to have like if you look at the so my experience that five milligrams not doing anything and that's not just me like, I, I think yeah. that with the CBD product people are just buying like I did they're just buying CBD because it says CBD on it they're not yeah. thinking about the dosage it's like going and getting buying if you went and bought paracetamol now mm -hmm. and you and it said um five milligrams per tablet you you would know five milligrams hang on a minute now paracetamol should be like 200 milligrams a tablet and that five milligrams i'm not going to touch the sites but we have that knowledge with cbd so when they make a five milligram tablet of cbd that is a lot cheaper than making a cbd tablet that's actually going to do something yeah. <laughs> so they they're sort of riding this wave of people buying it they're taking it because oh that's a like a cool hip thing to do to CBD. I can say I take CBD as opposed to people who are taking it for legitimate reasons, like I am, right? Yeah. Um, they're riding that wave. So I, and I've gone on for a year, paying money for a year, and I'm taking CBD, and it's not, I haven't been getting an impact from it because yeah. it's really low strength, and they're getting away with selling it. People think they're getting something from it. You know, it's like, fucking hell, man. That'll, that, you know, that'll, that'll change at some point. <laughs> then again, at the same time, I'm, um, I was going to say I'm not, at the uh, at the mercy of any drugs test, but then that's irrelevant with the two percent. That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, anyway, THC, right? Yeah. So, is your daughter, how does your daughter find the oils? She yeah, might, I, I mean, um, I think it's it's proved really is helpful. It droplets under the tongue. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, just proved very you know helpful in terms of creating that calmness. Oh, that's good. Which is uh, which is good. I think yeah. it's uh, I think it probably gets absorbed much quicker as well if you put it under the tongue, yeah. right? Absolutely. Yeah, that is good. That is good. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> off of CBD, it's not what we came here to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about travels and adventures and geography and, and, and uh, everywhere you've been in the book you've written. However, we were talking off air. So, you were one of the, you were part of one of the first companies to go into Iraq commercially for business after the invasion of Iraq and all the carnage of the aftermath in, oh, what was it, oh, four, oh, five, oh, six, oh, seven, oh, yeah, well, yeah, you went into Baghdad, right? Yeah, that, that's, you know, that's correct. So it was in, uh, we were invited by our customer, our then customer Talia, uh, to go to Iraq for a, I suppose, a connectivity conference. And <coughs> it was held at a hotel, um, at Baghdad International Airport, BAP. Um, I would say hotel. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, obviously within the green zone and uh, in a pre prefab prefab hotel. And 
uh yeah we were we were there for for two days you know we were we had obviously people bus to us we had uh you know it's quite a lot of uh interest in us being there as well so the the press were out in force coming to uh, interview and i i did try to use some of my arabic but they weren't interested they wanted to to talk to them in English. Well, it's different Arabic there, isn't it? Yeah. When I first when I first went there after I left the military, I first went working there, and I thought, right, I need to really start trying to learn Arabic just because I've always wanted to learn a language in my adult like, adult learning. Long story short, I downloaded an app. I was using an app to learn it. Okay. And uh, what I didn't know was the app was teaching me... Um, what the Iraqis refer to as dirty Arabic, Egyptian <laughs> Arabic, different. It was different. Like it was the the, the 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 regional dialect, the regional variations in the words and stuff. It was Egypt orientated, and I remember asking uh, the first time I used it, and I said to mm-hmm. one of the team members, I said, some, I think it was Isaac. I think I think I said something like, you know, Isaac and Isaiac, and whatever. Yeah. Isaac, yeah. Like, how are you? And his face screwed up. He's like, why the fuck are you talking like that <laughs> in English? And I was like, what? I was just asking how I said, you don't speak, don't speak like that. Yeah, it's filthy, fil- filthy dog language or something like that, he said. And then it was a schlonick, you know, a schlonick. Well, like, okay, I won't say it like again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's understandable. You know, I suppose the Egyptian dialect, and you're right, you know, there's something like 28 <laughs> different dialects of Arabic, excluding sub-dialects as well. You know, so you can get nuance, even within Egypt. Just within, within Egypt, you can get Kyrian um, nuances, you can get Alexandrian nuances. How does that compare to other languages? So 28 different yeah, dialects of Egyptian, how does that compare to English? Yeah, I, don't, I, I mean, uh, I think, I'm, you know, we, have, we obviously have variances in, in use of language in English, um, but not to the extent that I think that they're quite markedly different okay. in Arabic. In and what I, way? Well, I mean, I just get, you know, so when I when I first started working, I worked for a, one of the very, well, the very first uh, independent television news companies, Arabic television news companies, and everyone used English because that was the common, do you know what I mean? The, 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 the common language that everyone could communicate with uh, effectively because, you know, you just have this diversity, you know, it's between... Maghrebi di- or the or the Moroccan dialect, say Maghrebi dialect uh, of Arabic, and say Egyptian is just very very different, quite quite stark. Um, it's hard to de- it's hard to describe perhaps, but in English, but um, uh, it's not just a it's not just a difference in pronunci- pronunciation. It's actually different use of words, and in fact, when I was studying Arabic, you know. Um, uh, you know, obviously, Gulf Gulf War One had st- started uh, my fir- first year, uh, which um, meant that all these different language schools that used to be open to us as students were suddenly closed. So we all we all went to uh, either Egypt to Alexandria, and a few a few of my <coughs> colleagues went to study uh, in Yemen, uh, which again is a completely different Yemeni dialect is completely different. How different are we talking? Like. So you, you would struggle to understand yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I, w- I would struggle, yeah. So I, I think that Egyptian Arabic is actually, in fairness, I wouldn't call it dirty, I think is... Uh, <laughs> Don't tell the <laughs> Iraqis. <Iraqis. laughs> you know, it, is, is the one that's most accessible because of the just the power of the Egyptian, <clears throat> medi- Egyptian media, the Egyptian film industry, you know, just the circulation of Egyptian films, the circulation of Egyptian news as well in the region. Um, so everyone kind of understands it. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's kind of why do they have that power there? I, I think it's just because they they had a very vibrant film industry. I think first and foremost, at the, you know, um, you know, if you go back to kind of I suppose the nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties, you know, um, more so than any other other part of the Middle East region, and then as a consequence, obviously, those films in Arabic were getting distributed. I didn't uh, realize this. I yeah, because okay. uh, they have a massive film industry in Egypt. Massive. So I'm guessing that most of the films that you, most of the films that I would have seen there, like on Arabic TV or TV I'd be seeing in Iraq, for example, when I was working there, yeah. or 
Well, that's the best example. Or like Qatar, maybe when I'd be transiting through there, that would h highly likely be from out of the Egypt film industry. Egyptian Correct. Film industry. Correct. I didn't know this. Okay. Because yeah. when because naively as a Westerner, out, when you think of film industry outside of the West, you default to Bollywood. Don't you? Yeah. Oh, well, I, well, not you obviously don't because you know more. <laughs> but I think, okay, yeah, you got like Hollywood and you got Bollywood. There's nothing else, but obviously there is. And then you've got, then you must have, apart from the, the Egyptian film industry, there must be something separate again in terms of the films being chucked out in places like Nigeria. There must be some African powerhouses there, relatively speaking. I, I, I don't know, but I'm sure. Unintentional I'm, I'm comedy sure. flying around. <laughs> <over. laughs> uh, yeah. I, I think. In my in my third year, I I also uh, I'm cringing now. I chose to uh, I chose to study Sudanese dialect, okay, which, and I naively thought, oh, it'll be easy because it's just you know it's, it's just Egyptian and just a bit south, uh, which is just wrong because you you get you then get you you get words thrown in that. Uh, just don't really so i'll give you an example uh so i'll i'll, I'll just say uh, i'll say say a word so so shalakh uh, or shuluch you know this is the scarification on the on the face which they do in sudan you, you know again it's not a word that's that's prevalent or used anywhere else or uh you know in a, in a wedding ceremony uh the bride and groom they would um so they would sit on an, on a, on a on a camel stool and spit um, milk at each other. You know, again, it's the husband not, and wife. Yeah, correct. As part of the <laughs> part as part of the sort of the the wedding. The Why worry, do they do wedding, that? What's that? It's what, part of the wedding ceremony. That really? Yeah. <laughs> do, do, you, do you know what I mean? So these are cultural yeah. nuances to to yeah. Sudan that aren't, you know, that. They're not practiced in Egypt. They're not practiced in Iraq. So they don't have that. They're, they're not, uh, what's the word, transversal or, tr you know, transferable from one yeah. dialect to to, uh, to another. I, before you started saying that, uh, that those, those, those uh, are giving the explanations, I was, I was thinking it was kind of like, it would be kind of like getting, a, you know, someone from China over here to mm -hmm. study English in whatever <laughs> college or uni right in let, let's say it's london okay you can learn english and they learn english and then the the china person the chinese person says right okay i'm gonna i'm gonna go learn the brummy dialect now <laughs> <laughs> that can't be that hard because <laughs> it's just english <laughs> or they go all right i'm gonna go and learn the glaswegian dialect now it can't be that hard it's just english not knowing that People who speak English everywhere struggle to fucking understand those dialects. I mean, Brummy is like a different world, especially here. We're, like we're in Lemon Spa now. Wild. The uh, the the dialect here and the accent here is so mild, right? You got twenty minutes on a train, yeah, you, or drive thirty minutes west. You could be on a different planet, a different language. You don't you don't understand. It's so wildly different from the way they pronounce standard words to. Words that don't exist anywhere outside of Birmingham, and that's the Bur the British Birmingham. <laughs> that's not <laughs> that's not Birmingham with like second or third gener uh, like a, a second or third generation, um, you know, from from immigrants who came came over and and lived here. It's like wild, mate, wild. It's the yeah. Same everywhere, I think. But it's a, it's that similar kind of I suppose dialectic difference that we do have like yeah. that. Uh, it's just a bit more. Uh, it it just. Is is an, it goes on another level of difference? Uh, the you know, um, yeah. I had a uh, thinking about it again. Another example. I uh, I messaged um, someone who's Northern Irish the other day, right? And I said, "Do you know this? Do you know this person?" And I sent I sent them. It's Liz McCorney actually. Okay. I sent Liz a picture of someone. I said, "Do you know this person?" And the response again. I'm thinking of a Chinese person doing this interaction. And the response I got. If I text was N O I I I I I I I I I, right? Okay. Now, <laughs> you can only know the what that is if you know the accent. So what Liz is saying is, "Nay," she's saying, "No, no." 
So she's saying, uh, like, and okay. it's like an explanation. Now it's like, oh, it's like we would say, oh, <laughs> that person, oh, which she's, no, it's not an English word. It's not a, one you would say. It's not one you would type down. But because I know the accent, I think, no, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, languages, languages. Why did you choose, why did you choose to learn Arabic? So that, um, that's a great question. <laughs> And and I, and I think you know I I kind of often I ask myself that uh, no, um, you know I I spent my a vast post vast majority of my childhood growing up in the in the Middle East region so it's easy to say that it it just seemed the right thing to do at the time, but um, I think I I did have if you like a a cultural you know affinity um, with with the region and. Um, I suppose it was it was different. Do you, do, do you know what I mean? I did I did some of my A levels were in, you know, the English and maths and and politics. I could have probably gone off and done an English degree or whatever, you know. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I, I I just felt a great affinity, and I was actually very focused, and that's absolutely what I what I wanted to do. Um, and wanted to to work in that region in some capacity. <clears throat> mm. um, it's a fascinating language. When I, it, it, it's the one. It's the first thing that opened my eyes to how. It sounds a silly thing to say. How wildly different languages are around the world. Mm -hmm. You know how different Arabic is to English. Arabic is to Chinese. Arabic is to all these other languages. We look at Chinese, for example. Yeah. But then, I remember le learning Arabic and 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 early on realizing that for most of the letters in the, in the alphabet, it's four different ways to write them. We've only, got, we've only got two different ways to write them in English, mainly. And there's four different ways to, ways to write letters in Arabic. And I think, oh, my God, this is like four times as hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, so, so we, you know... Um, and, and the vowels. There's no vowels. The vowels are accents on, on letters. So, you know, it's... Uh, it, it's correct. It's not as simple to... It's like a lot of introduction to, you need to use to read informally written words. Yeah, and then you have to interpret quite often because... Mm. You know, just generally, if you pick up a news, newspaper, for example, today, so what you're referring to, the vowels, or is 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 defined through what they call tashkil, which is all the squiggles above and below the letters. <coughs> well, if you buy a newspaper, they're not they're not there, so you have to interpret. Oh, are they not? Do, do you have to know what what the word is? Why don't they include them in the print? Mark? I I think it's. Uh, uh, I, well, cost, I, I just cost maybe. no, no. I just think it's just a just the way the language has evolved mm. over over time. Do you, do you know what I mean? To form what we call today or understand today is modern standard Arabic. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was quite quite tough at the beginning. I mean, it was very old school. I would say in the sense that um, the lang you know, learning the language, you have a very high dropout rate at the beginning. So I would say, you know, of those people that chose to do Arabic at Durham, you know, 10 to 15% would drop out at the very, very beginning within the first two weeks and go and do another course. Um, the dropout rate after that was was pretty low, if not non-existent. But it was tough. You know, we, we would, we'd have to obviously learn, you know, the four forms, for example, of a, of a letter of the alphabet. We'd have to learn the alphabet. We then also have to know all of our numbers, one to ten. We'd all also have to probably know about 200 words and, and know all of that within a space of two weeks. Mm. So it's quite intensive. 200 words within two weeks. Yeah, and Jesus. then constant language lab. So when you learn, you know, at Durham, when you know, learning Arabic, is 40-hour week. Yeah, so... Yeah, so there's a, it was a component, which is, you know, if you think, you know, if you go and do, I don't know, um, say, a, say a, you know, like a, you know, a business degree or something like that, you'll probably have got about 10 hours of lectures a week. Yeah. So, you know, sort of language lab. Um, and then obviously you've got all the other lessons, you know, I suppose around the history, politics uh, of the of the region as well, the literature. Mm. Um, so it's quite it's quite intensive, or it was quite intensive. So, did that, but did that keenness in Arabic did that come from 
the, the the childhood in Somalia, growing up there. Yeah. So, and it, well, I suppose the first uh, sort of Middle Eastern country we lived in was actually Saudi Arabia. So, um, my uh, my dad worked for the Foreign Office. You know, forty years um, in the Foreign Office, and uh, we got posted, or he got posted there. I should say we got posted there in nineteen nineteen eighty. Um, and at that time, the British Embassy was actually located in Jeddah. It's currently now in Riyadh. Um, and it was a, quite an interesting time, I think, in, culturally as well for for Saudi Arabia. It also coincided with uh, the UK securing um, the very first Al Yamama contract as well, um, which is the first kind of very large military contract. Uh, cooperation between the UK and, oh, okay. and Saudi Arabia. Is that uh, it goes as early as then yeah. that started? I didn't Correct. realize that. Correct. Al-Yamama 1 goodness me. was 1980, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, and the ambassador at the time was a guy called, it was a lovely guy called Sir James Craig, and he'd actually interestingly been a, a lecturer in Arabic at Durham University <laughs> about, uh, I suppose, about 20 years prior. Uh, but he was a very eminent Arabist, um, spoke Arabic fluently, um, <coughs> and yeah, very, very nice, nice guy. Um, and my my dad ended up getting promoted and what's called cross-posted. So um, that basically means that we went from one post to the next directly rather, we did come back to the UK, but in effect, went from one post to the next straight away with very little sort of air gap between the two. Um, and um, we, he was posted to Somalia. And, you know, I, uh, he, he'd had a posting for two years in the early 70s to Ethiopia. And uh, I was quite young then, but um, uh, absolutely loved it. And so, you know, naturally thought that we were going back to a country which is very similar. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we returned to the UK and, you know, the environment, even at even at that time, was pretty <coughs> complex uh, in Somalia, you know, in terms of... 81, 82. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of access to, for example, fresh vegetables, food, you know, just foodstuffs was just very challenging. So... Um, I, I can still recall my mum and dad, you know, going to the cash and carry and just buying just just almost like very large crate crate loads of food, dried food to take with us, <clears throat> um, which was which was shipped to post. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and so we we was posted there in 1981. And we were initially put up in the main sort of state-run hotel, which is the Al Aruba Hotel, which is quite um, uh, is quite a presence on the on the Lido on the waterfront, overlooking um, the uh, uh, the, uh, the the tower, uh, and very close to the port. And the tower. Um, what, what tower? Yeah, so it's a very kind of I suppose medieval uh, lighthouse and watchtower on the on the, okay. on the on the harbour. Which, when you see images of um, Somalia, particularly of the, I suppose, um, the War of Mogadishu or sort of Black Hawk Down, that kind of uh, time, you know, that, that it's it's an image that would you'd be familiar with. Uh, obviously, the building at that time was completely intact. <laughs> yeah. um, so we stayed in the in, in the Al Aruba Hotel. There weren't. A great deal of options in terms of hotels. The only other hotel was um, a hotel called the Croce del Sol or the Southern Cross um, okay. Hotel, uh, which was actually run by an Italian family. Uh, it was friends of mine from school. Uh, his parents ran the hotel. Um, and uh, they were originally from Padua in, uh, in Italy. Um, so... I, I suppose I should just put it in context. Um, <coughs> you know, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. At the end of the end of the last century, uh, I suppose uh, you know, sort of Africa was was carved carved up uh, by the colonial powers, and um, or the nineteenth century, yeah, yeah, and uh, 
you know if you if you if for example if you look at a if you look at a map of east africa yeah um you've got these really straight lines <laughs> that say divide ethiopia from somalia or it's wild uh, from kenya it's wild yeah. how they decided to do that just that really way. very straight you know like, why not follow uh, some ridge lines or something yeah. you know like every other sensible country has done there's a natural border in place yeah. <laughs> Well, it, it, and it, and that, and that's what I suppose is that legacy that's caused so many issues subsequently. You know, in terms of not reflecting um, where tri, you know, where t tribal grazing grounds yeah. Um, are, yeah, that cross that cross those straight lines, yeah, um, or indeed the 1977 Ogaden War between Ethiopia and Somalia. Um, over contested territory um so anyway so we we arrived and we we as we stayed in this this hotel and um so i'll just say that it was just a it was just an experience you know um uh that i th i think there was a, a very quick realization um from you know my parents that the environment that we had just kind of moved into was going to test us yeah it was going to be very challenging living there and i think my dad naturally was quite upset about that because obviously he felt responsible he'd brought his family there and um what did your mum think well my mum was an amazing lady um she uh she's she really was um I, I mean, obviously, she loved my dad very much and followed him to all sorts of interesting places, including 18 months in in Saigon during the war, and where uh, she uh, she volunteered for the American Red Cross at the Third Field Hospital oh, for 18 wow. months. Yeah, so she she was a really very powerful, you know, very strong lady, um, and she was the one that turned around to him and just said, "Well, you you know, just kind of almost like pull yourself together." And we, you know, we're just going to have to get on with this and make the best of it we can. Do you, do you know what I mean? I just mm. very, it's kind of stuck with me that that moment mm. uh, forever. <laughs> um, so sometimes, as as tough as advice that is, it's literally the only option. You know, if there's no well, if there's no other way to get through something, it's sort of it's sort of like we we need to man up, we need to man up and get through this. Uh, absolutely, and there was no other option. Yeah. The end. Of, uh, I, I suppose the only other option was for him to probably resign because some. My dad worked for something <coughs> called the Diplomatic Wireless Service, or what was pr prior called the Special Communications Unit, um, was set up by Brigadier Gamba Parry at Bletchley Park and Wadden, was to provide initially in its foundation. Um, specialist communications for SOE, and then subsequently diplomatic communications, MI6 communications. Is this where your interest in comms? Probably, yeah. <laughs> so, <it's> just... <laughs> <laughs> so for people unaware, <laughs> people unaware, Steve has a has a, a extensive history and experience in the satcoms industry. It's fair to say that, right? That, that's yeah. right. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be reintroduced by Dave Davis, That's who also <laughs> is the same like, right, okay, it makes sense now, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, in in those days, you know, today in the Foreign Office you would you like to go for you know, we've invite you get invited to you know, go for a posting or you wow. get some choice choice in the matter. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? Not then it was like um my 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 dad's boss at the time, I think his name was uh, Edgar Harrison, who is um, w within that sort of uh, that fraternity, particularly during the war years, was extremely well known. Yeah, uh, in terms of providing uh, comms through the special communications unit, and he basically told him he was going, and it was that that was it. And so you had you had you I suppose you had the only option you had at that point was to resign. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So we did make the very most of it, and um, it, it it was quite a small embassy actually. In the, in those days, it was no more than five, I think, five staff. Um, and we lived at kilometre twenty out of town, um, 
from Mogadishu to another town called Afgoi, which is about, I suppose, about 30, 40 kilometers away, um, literally in the middle of nowhere. So there were four bungalows on the ro- on the main road yeah. um, uh, out of town. Um, the ambassador lived at the residence which was in town and very close to what's called Villa Somalia, which is the presidential palace. Um, And again, just in terms of, I suppose, context, um, President Siad Barre was the president. He was uh, a military dictator um, that had a a military coup in 1969. Um, I should say Somalia achieved independence from the British and the Italians in 1960. and Mogadishu would have fallen part of Italian Somaliland historically. Okay. Um, so Siad, Siad Barre was uh, was in power, and just in terms of, I suppose, his kind of political leaning um, from the, I suppose, from the revolution, he was definitely le- leaned to the east. You know, he was a socialist. Um, interestingly, he was. Um, he was originally chief of police and then moved into the military, but he was trained by the British. He was trained by the Italians. He was also trained by the Russians as well. Okay. Um, but um, he ruled the country with an absolute iron fist. He had very, a very effective um, security service called the NSS. Um, very effective. And um, I suppose, uh, and, and again, this kind of, created a tension which we've seen subsequently over the course of the last 30 years but he outlawed the whole sort of concept and notion of tribalism or clanism and everyone was somali okay so um and what was the reason for doing that i I think it was to create a unifying force in effect um but he 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 did um he he did absolutely challenge any notion of 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 clanism um i suppose maybe i don't know maybe in in certain situations in tribes and clans over there mm-hmm. you know there exists it exists like the 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 clan the tribe comes before the country as in loyalty to the tribe before the country where you wouldn't necessarily want that if you were, especially not a dictator. You wouldn't want that. No. Okay. No, no, you wouldn't want that. And and again, I think it's, that's a great point actually, because if we see what's occurred subsequently since the civil war and night kicked off in 1991, we've had the you know the emergence of um, uh, Al Shabab, which is an Al Qaeda affiliate. <coughs> And they've very much leveraged the um, the tribal the tribal network, the tribal elders, and um, without, so I suppose, putting too much of a finer point on it, it sort of operates like um, a mafia, yeah, and leverages the clans to to extort, yeah, or leverages the clan elders to extort money to fund it not a dissimilar model to what the Taliban yeah, done could, in the past, yeah. you know? uh, absolutely or the Mujahideen I think yeah. uh, ab- absolutely absolutely so he uh, he so Siad Barre suppressed um, the notion of tribes and clans um, to try and create this sort of unifying um, um, I suppose force country um, so uh, yeah, so, so, it, so, it, so we we we've we've arrived in the realization that uh, we're we're going to be living here for the next, you know, the next couple of years, and we're going to be making the most of it. <coughs> and um, we were taken first by the uh, the ambassador and his wife to um, Jazeera Beach, which is uh, for for people that know Somalia is very well known, um, just absolutely beautiful. I mean. I think one of the things that kind of again has stuck with me and I, and I always say this is that um, you know we've got 
uh, Seychelles, you've got the Maldives and what have you, but nothing can beat the beauty of Somali beaches. And I, and I really sincerely mean that. It's just, they are breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking, mile after mile after mile of pristine, beautiful white sand and turquoise water. I mean, it's just, just amazing. Um, and uh, so initially we, we spent a lot of time in the uh, Jazeera area. Um, and then obviously as time passed, we then started to venture much further, much further afield uh, up and down the coast. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was... How secure was it journey, journeying around then? Um, I think it was on the whole pretty secure. I'd say that, you know, uh, I probably shouldn't say, but I, my dad had a Beretta and uh and a, and a nice cool box full of rounds <laughs> but uh uh you know i don't think he, you know we, we i don't think we ever felt that we were in do you know what i mean in in mortal danger or anything like that i think i think we we yeah we, we uh ran a greater risk of getting illness do, do you know what I mean? Than mm. than an impact to our sort of, I suppose, personal protection. Why do you think it changed so much between then and now? Because it's that's definitely not the case now, you know. No, it, no, it's not. I mean, again, I think what what eventually so uh, what eventually happened is 1991. Siad <coughs> Barre loses power and he dies. I mean, this is after he's had a terrible he had a terrible car accident in or in 19. Uh, 1986, um, uh, which um, injured you know injured him. But um, what what you end up seeing happening from 91 is the you know as we as we've seen in in, in other countries is the emergence of competing forces for power and and typically again senior military uh, um, leaders coming to the form so. Uh, you know, General Adid, um, and but others, you know, coming coming to the fore, trying to stake a claim to um, effectively take on the mantle of uh, Siad Barre. Um, and what happens is the the or what happened is the country just descended into chaos. And um, yeah, I mean, I I I'd you know. I recall vividly um, Christine Amanpour from CNN. Uh, it was December 1992, um, interviewing a SEAL team as it's landing just south of the airport in Mogadishu. Oh, right. And um, uh, as, as part of Operation uh, Restore Hope, which is a, a UNITAF operation, to try and bring some control back. And um, I, I can just, you know, again, just, uh, you know, those, those, um, there was SEAL team and US Marines, you know, when they landed, I just, it was the, it was the first, I suppose, one of the very first uh, instances of live broadcast from a f effectively a front line. And they must have been kind of like really overwhelmed, do you know what I mean? You know, just to have these, suddenly have these cameras and these spotlights and just mm. a load of press around them when they're obviously trying to <laughs> get, get ashore discreetly, mm. you know, so, and it, it just, it just continued from there. And it was just, um, it was just, just carnage. And it created this vacuum from, from that period, um, which, um, which just allowed, Al Shabab, uh, in particular, the I suppose the uh, the Islamic courts, but Al Shabab to uh, to to take a very strong position, yeah, um, in the vacuum, you know, just in the in the absence of any any leadership really. So um, yeah, uh, and that's just that was allowed to prevail certainly up until about 2013 2014 when you know then you've got un missions going back in kenyans going in 
Ethiopians going in, um, and then the, obviously the Americans going in as well. Just what were the Kenyans and Ethiopians doing? Well, again, so that part of the challenge is with, with um, the emergence of al-Shabaab, and obviously this sort of, the, the conflict started to bleed into northern Kenya, started to bleed in a bit into into <coughs> Ethiopia. So it was kind of, it was for their own, I suppose, um, their own security. security mm. do, 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 do you know what I mean? To to stem um, stem some of this activity, um, and in Kenya in, in particular has been, you know, playing a, a for a long time a role in trying to route Al Shabaab in particular from northern Kenya, but also into southern Somalia, as a as as rightly I think as a, a defensive posture to just make do you know what I mean maintain their yeah. sovereign integrity yeah i'm just looking at the uh, i'm looking at the map now i remember going into uganda in 2009 and then there was all sorts i mean that yeah the the, the al shab al shabab presence and other terrorist groups at the time were all over the place not in uganda but mm -hmm. um the surrounding you know kenya somalia ethiopia and then when I went into I went into Mozambique in twenty nineteen. I went into Mozambique on a humanitarian aid mission, and uh, the same there, like the north and the west of Mozambique, and and around yeah, and around the, the border with Zambia there was also problematic in terms of terrorist issues. It wasn't safe up there necessarily. What do you think? So question. <laughs> do you do you think Africa as a continent would have been would have been better off for it if it had not been for colonial colonialization? Oh, that's an that's another great question. And again, I think um, No, the straight lines certainly didn't help. <laughs> well, the straight, the straight, the straight lines certainly, certainly, di certainly didn't help. I mean, I think, I think it's, um, uh, you know, it's it, uh, it's it's easy, it's easy to also to knock. I think it's also just, you know, it's now it's a matter of history. Do, do you know what I mean? And I, and I and I think it's also important to look at things in terms of context. You know, but particularly the Horn of Africa. Now, the Horn of Africa has been at war, waging war for centuries. You know, it just hasn't happened in the last 30 years or, you know, in the last five years. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it's been something that's been there for many thousands of years. Um, and you can understand why. I suppose it's because it's, of you know, it's... Uh, geographic position, you know, where it sits in the Indian Ocean, where it sits relative <coughs> to the Middle East, where it sits relative to the ancient kingdoms of the north, ancient, uh, you know, ancient, Ro you know, the Roman Empire or ancient Greece, ancient Egypt. Um, so I think I think war has been uh, has been a feature for for centuries and just you know. Con a, contest for land but not just you know not just for the sake of land it's it's about access you know uh, minerals like gold or uh in you know um myrrh frankincense uh, you know spices uh they've they've all, all contributed um in in some way so i think um you know, uh, I, I'm sure Somalis would dis disagree. Um, I think there's some some many positive benefits that that period brought the country in terms of um, trying to create structure or trying to stabilize or indeed just provide education. Um, but I'm sure there are many that would say absolute rubbish, you know, that... Um, it uh, just brought carnage as well in its own form. <laughs> Isn't the book, am I correct in saying that the book Heart of Darkness by Conrad, Joseph Conrad, 
Am I right in saying that that is about the start of what is the start of colonialization in in Africa, or am I misremembering that? Yeah, I think I think you are right. Yeah, it's also what Apocalypse Now is based on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, although it's wildly different, the wildly <laughs> Apocalypse Now is wildly different to what the book is about. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it I is, think isn't it? It's the East India. It's the East Indian companies. It's, it's correct. The first. Rep- one of the first representatives or bosses of the East India mm-hmm. Trading Company, right? Heading into the heart of Africa to go and do business. Is it? That's correct. Isn't yeah. It? I mean, you, you know, it goes it goes without saying that there are kind of many aspects that <laughs> are negative without question. Um, many, many aspects. And particularly if you go back far enough, you know, around slavery in particular, um, you know, which are just completely abhorrent, but well, it still exists today. It still exists it's just today. Just not involved. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, and um, you you could argue that some of these terror organisations are involved in that as well. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I think the other interesting thing, you know, is so we've got the emergence of Al Shabab, but we also have their arch enemy. We have ISIS, yeah, and I, I think I think people, you know, uh, in the West are very very quick to conflate. Do, do you know what I mean? Terrorist organizations as being, well, it's all you they're know, all on the bad guy. They're the bad guys. They're yeah, they're, the and they're side. all like, they're all on the same side when yeah. they're not. You know, uh, so uh, and it's been interesting as as part of the current, I suppose, um, uh, Israeli Palestinian conflict. Uh, some of the sort of the rhetoric and language used, you know, is that um, uh, what's it? Hamas is ISIS. Um, uh, actually, ISIS declared war on Hamas in, in 2018, so I don't think that they are. But um, it's it's it would be correct to say that um, Al Shabab, which is an Al Qaeda affiliate, has come out and clearly supported Hamas. Do, do you know what I mean? So that kind of like nuance, but it's just. I think it's it's also helpful to understand some of the local dynamics that exist as well. So I, I, IS isn't as isn't as, as strong obviously as Al Shabab in uh, in what's, the Horn of Africa. What's Al Shabab's objective? Uh, well, I suppose the creation of a caliphate and that uh, follows uh, a Salafi Sunni so the doctrine. Same as, more or less the same as ISIS then. Yeah, you could say you could say so. Correct. What's the problem with each other? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know whether it's a question. I, I honestly, I don't know. I don't. Know if it's a question of leadership, or mm. um, you know, at the end of the day, this all comes down to a power struggle rather than necessarily one of philosophy, power and money. Yeah. Um, but I think what what's been very positive over the course of the last few years in particular um, is that um, uh, the Somali government is is winning its war uh, or, or seemingly winning its war and becoming quite effective at um, at uh, displacing and depositioning um, Al Shabab. Um, however, the reality is, in, and many of the towns that I talk about in the book. Are still under the control of Al Shabaab, mm. <laughs> even today. So, um, you know, and and uh, so, 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 so they police themselves, I suppose. Like, yeah, like you would get. I go back to the Taliban reference. Yeah, because I have, a, you know, understand that it's you know, a town under the Taliban control. They don't have any Afghan national police, for example. <laughs> the Co- Taliban are policing it. It's the same in Somalia. correct. So you've got, you know, again, it's the you've got the power of the tribal elders, and this is the tribal elders that would effectively be the the judge and jury, judge, you know what I mean, and be able and administer the uh, the local the local area. So you can see how that, do you know what I mean, how that exists, or they would be involved in settling disputes between different people or different tribes or what, whatever. Yeah. Um, how did uh, how did Somalia compare to Ethiopia? Yeah, so I, I mean, obviously I was very uh, I was very young in uh, in Ethiopia, so my sort of my memories there are are 
are very very distant but um from you know from what i understand you know i suppose there's some fundamental differences in terms of religion you know so uh, ethiopia um is predominantly a, a christian uh country and obviously you know somalia is a is a, is a muslim one and um so there's some very different cultural uh, differences as a consequence that flow out from that. I think the other thing I would say is that when my my parents first, you know, as we first lived there, um, it was under the um, under the rule of the emperor Haile Selassie, who had a very uh, good relationship, um, in particular with the UK, actually, um, and then. Towards the end of their time, um, the, uh, the 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 emperor was overthrown by the Derg, and um, uh, with the support of the uh, overthrown by the Derg, so the the Marxist movement in Ethiopia. The Derg. It sounds like someone off of Star Trek. Yeah. What, so what are DR, they called? DRG. What are those ones called on Star Trek? The, the, the cyborgs, aren't they? The uh, what are they called? <laughs> Can you remember, you know what I'm on about? They got the they got the uh, they have like the, the digital monocle, don't they? Yeah. The Borg, the Borg, the Borg, yeah, the, the, Borg. Borg the Derg. Okay, the Derg, yeah, right, yeah. And uh, you know they were they were backed uh, by the uh, TPLF, uh, which is the Tigray People's Liberation Front, a uh, very powerful force uh, in Ethiopia, um, and in effect. Turn the company upside, turn the country upside down, and imposed Marxist rule. So Ethiopia, yeah, Jesus. So that was nineteen. I was going to say late seventy four, seventy five. And that Marxist rule tends not to work out very well for no. And, and so what's interesting is that you've got you you know Marxist. So nineteen seventy seven, the Ogaden War. You've got Marxist Ethiopia, and you've got socialist Eastern leaning Somalia. You'd think that they were, you know, roughly on the on the same side, and then and again, you know, Siad Barre then kicks off a a very bloody war in the Ogaden, um, yeah. which is oh, sorry, which is interestingly supported by um, uh, mercenaries from uh, Rhodesia, <clears throat> yeah, uh, flying hawker hunters. Uh, and I and I do remember actually the uh, the hawker hunters that were sorry where's this Ethiopia in Somalia oh Somalia yeah yeah, 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 yeah. so bombing Ethiopian positions um, and I and I do recall oh, that's right. That's right, yeah. <laughs> I do recall the uh, you know the Somali Air Force having uh, having these these hunters as part of their you know Independence Day display uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, it's uh, so it's cu culturally a very, you know, very interesting country, um, and there are, I suppose, there's a few sort of things that I touch on in the book, which I kind of wonder whether they exist today. So, um, we were invited to uh, attend what's called uh, an istunka or a stick fight in uh in afgoi which was um a a a town on the shabeli river and this is a, a you know this is a pre-islamic this is the irony this is a, a pre-islamic tradition um it's you know for the festival of dabshid which is uh, an annual festival that co occurs around the 27th 28th of july um and uh, as I understand it, dates back to, um, uh, I suppose, Zoroastrian from Persia, Zoroastrian traditions of mm. of um, having this sort of fight uh, in order to bring, um, you know, it, uh, to bring goodwill and to uh, uh, have a prosperous um, uh, uh, growing season for the new for the new year um so we were invited to to go to this this uh the stick fight this is stunka and um uh in effect what you have are two tr 
two, I was going to say tribes, but I'm sure it's two clans that um, straddled the river that effectively come together each year for this massive stick fight. And it's not a case of just, you know, just a sort of, you know, just a, you know, ra random <laughs> fight down the boozer. Do you know what I mean? This is a, this is... Boozers do you get a stick fight? This is a, you know, an ancient martial art. Yeah. Okay, right. Okay. What's it called? It, it, well, so it's called Istunka. Istunka, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and a fire is lit in the in the center um and there's you know there's dancing there's jumping over the fire as well um but then they have this stick fight and um so these two i suppose these two different clans it, it, it kind of reminds me a bit of uh mayday and padstow uh between the two osses <laughs> they talk about <laughs> <laughs> um and they, you know, they basically, they, uh, they, they fight. And what was interesting is that, you know, uh, as the fight was going on, you saw, uh, I suppose, two or three tiers back, men digging in the ground to, big, to dig out much bigger, heavier sticks. Uh, <laughs> so you have to find them in the air. You well, no, so they, the they go in with sticks. It's not like conkers to... where you prepare the conker for like right. six months in vinegar and all that. <laughs> you have to go. <laughs> you have to go and find your sticks. So the stick, sticks have you know they have their sticks, which then obviously have to conform to a certain size and weight and dimension. I'm looking at some. Are they, but these are big sticks. I'm looking at the yeah. pictures of Istunka on, online now. They are big sticks. But they they would bury bigger sticks, yeah. Ah, <laughs> pre, pre like plant them. Ple yeah, correct. Incredible. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and then and then obviously they'd have this stick fight, and then um, there would be you know the elders would determine who's won on the basis of uh, skill, prowess. Um, how they've conducted themselves on the, you know, on the battlefield, so to speak, and the the winning side would then be, uh, in effect, would it would would be given, I suppose, good fortune. Uh, do you know what I mean for the for the next agricultural season? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was quite a, it was quite an eye opener for us. So it says here. Um... Uh, the event is a, it symbolizes the defense of one's community and honor. It coincides with the start of the main harvest season, as you said. Istunka was originally performed in full combat gear with battle axes, swords, and daggers. <laughs> Wild! <laughs> however, for safety reasons, <laughs> however, for safety reasons, performers later replaced those weapons with large sticks or batons. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, this is the thing. I, I, I love having conversation, conversations like this because, you know, most people grow up like I did. I grew up, I have a very narrow view of what the world is. You know, uh, I grew up in Wales. I live in England, you know, for Irish mother, Scottish father. And I was in the military. So I've been in a few different places and I did some traveling anyway. I did, did a little bit of traveling afterwards. But relatively speaking, I have seen naff all of the world and I understand very little of it. It's all these little like insights into crazy little cultures and behaviors and practices in parts of the world where you're probably never going to end going and go and spend enough time to actually get embedded with the culture and understand. Mm -hmm. you, I can go to Somalia for a week, right? If I wanted to, three weeks if I wanted to, I'm not going to get the insight into it that someone like you has got. You know, it's just so different. So to hear the hear the thing, like I didn't, I didn't ever yeah. know about Istunka, for example. Well, yeah, it's really interesting. And it only happens in Somalia as well. It only happens yeah. in Somalia, yeah. and as I understand, it only <laughs> happens on those dates, you know, or that date. Yeah, yeah, the start of the season. So, um, you know, I, so that you're right. I just, I think, would feel very fortunate and privileged to have experienced it and witnessed it in a way i mean i should say it was very quiet in the cargo back home 
but um but yeah um uh just and and i think you know now just obviously as a as an adult reflecting back and appreciating that you know this isn't an islamic tradition this predates this predates islam so this has been going on for a very long time yeah this tradition um and you know in in other parts of uh, somalia as well um uh, my only question is and i and i don't know the answer is whether it goes on today do you know what i mean because it could be argued as being kind of pagan um because it's not islamic hmm. so it may you know it may you know particularly well certainly as far as afgoi is concerned afgoi came under the control of al-shabaab so i, I can't imagine al-shabaab would 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 permit it but again i could be wrong mm. yeah with your experience uh there in somalia another islamic countries um and a lot of arabic countries right with the experience mm -hmm. there well what's your perception of the religion of islam in like i mean do you perceive it as what some people perceive it as as an an evil religion a religion that it, in it, the structure and its belief system is inherently evil in inverted commas or not how do you how do you see it no i i actually see it as quite a peaceful religion and um i i um there's people right now there's people that are freaking out. I know. Throwing their phones <laughs> out the window. What the fuck is he talking about? But I was going to say, you know, I, I'm probably... I'm Does he probably, watch the TV? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I probably lean, lean much more towards, uh, you know, Su Sufism, you know, uh, the, the kind of the more spiritual aspect of, uh, of Islam. Um, uh, I'm not a Muslim, I should point Explain out. Sufism. But, Explain okay, Sufism. Okay, so... Um, so Sufism is much more about the, um, I suppose the, I suppose the sort of, uh, the, the metaphysical aspect of the, of the religion and, and belief system. Um, it's much more passive and peaceful, um, uh, rather than some of the heated aggression that you might see on the, on the television or what have you, but, um, Sufism. So according to the, the web. Sufism, also known as Tasawwuf? Tasawwuf, yeah, tasawuf. which is the act of becoming a Sufi, Tasawwuf. Okay, okay. It's a mystic body of religious practice found within Islam, which is, which is characterized by a focus on Islamic provocation, spirituality, ritualism, ascetism, ascetism, asceticism, asceticism, and esotericism. Uh, what else? Okay, so Sufism is a different one. Sufism, mystical Islamic belief and practice in which Muslims seek to find the truth of divine love. I prefer this explanation. The truth of divine love and knowledge through direct personal experience of God. Yeah. So it's much more, do you know what I mean? A much more passive. It does. And it sounds to yeah. me like something you read about. I mean, replace the word Muslim with Buddhism yeah. or Buddhist. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so I probably ascribe more to that. I should say. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I, I, I um, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a world religion, and it's probably you know it's a you know just again, your your some of your listeners are probably <laughs> cringe, but that that you know. Has, has probably got a bad a bad rap. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Because of um, what they've seen, what they've experienced. The probably what I'd call the more extreme ends, as in any religion. Yeah, we've, we we you look in Christianity. Um, you know, the, the sort of more extreme ends of Christianity. Yeah, there is there is a major difference. <laughs> yeah, like the and that is the way the way I see it is the way that the. Yeah, the, you look at Christianity, you've got the, the, the Testaments, right? And then you look at the Quran, and it's a very different type of book. And it's much less open to interpretation, whereas the Bible, I think, is. It's, it's, 
you can you can interpret the passages and things that, 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 that in different ways. You know, you can draw lessons and inferences the different ways you want to. But the way the Quran's written, I've written, I, I've I've read most of it, and it's not much. It's not much open to interpretation. Now, I think, but they both written a very long time ago obviously the yeah. Quran is much more recent relatively speaking but I think that the key thing to remember where Islam is concerned and seems Christianity it's evolved so mm-hmm. people you know it, it, the, the practice has evolved and it seems I, I think that Islam is, evol- is evolving away from you look at think about Sharia Sharia law it's evolving away from that, and people are changing to accommodate what modern day pra- what modern day life needs to be, and how and how to interpret and what to listen to and what to not listen to in the Quran. And the same way they do with in the same day in the same day we do with parts of the Bible. When you think about homosexuality and things like that, um, I think it's just a lot harder to do that with Islam because of the way the Quran's written. Yeah, I, I think that you know that's a fair comment. You know, because as you correctly point out, you know the the Quran. Um, is communicated to being the word of God <coughs> and unquestionable, whereas you could argue that the Bible is a collection collection of books. Yeah, um, we should say that the Quran draws very heavily on the Old Testament as well, okay. uh, as you as you probably know. Um, uh, I think I think the challenge, and you, I think again, you hit the nail on the head. There's this concept in Arabic called tafsir which is um, uh, Islamic exegesis or interpretation of the, not only the Quran, I should say, but also the Hadith. So the, 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 the actions and sayings of not only the Prophet, but also the Prophet's followers. And those are all open to interpretation and you get good, you get good, hadith and um, not so good hadith I should put it or good interpretation and not so good interpretation more extreme interpretation um, I think I think you know I think um, again we we live in a world um, that's quite polarized I think at, at, the, at the minute um, and the, and the same at the same within you know within Islam I think um, there is that polarization there and it's quite often used um, you know, as a as a battle cry, um, you know, to 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 galvanize and you you know people to 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 fight. So, um, yeah, um, but I, I I like to look at the. Do you know what I mean? I you know I have, uh, as I'm sure you do, I have Muslim friends, and I like to look to the, you know, to the uh, to the to the good as well um, where I can. Yeah, uh, your your experience with it and your opinion of it, if I, I it reminds me of an interview with another guy called Alex. Oh, what the hell is his surname? I think it's Thompson. And Alex is a he's an American. Spent a lot of time in the Middle East. Uh, he. He's an Arabist. Mm-hmm. I'm glad I learned that word today from him. Arabist. So he's you know, an Arabic speaker. He learned to speak Arabic, Arabic in pretty confident it was Yemen. Okay. And he wrote a book. Uh, is it up there? No, he wrote a book called... I can't remember what it's called. Shit. Uh, <laughs> I'll look it up. Oh, God. Anyway, he wrote a book about his experiences and part of that is learning Arabic in, in, in Yemen. But he speaks of Islam. And Muslims in the same way that you do. Mm-hmm. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a peaceful religion. Um, it's a very welcoming religion. Uh, people are very accommodating, and I have the same experience with that. You know, some of the most hospitable people I've ever met have been in the Middle East, in countries mm-hmm. are rooted in, in Arab, in uh, in in Islam, not Arab, in, in in Islam. You know, it's uh, it is that way. I, I think it is that way. Um, but uh, you know it is also, but it is also unfortunately very convenient to label it in certain circumstances as an evil religion, which I think is incorrect. I, I don't. I if I had my way, I, there wouldn't be any religions. I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't like the idea of any of them. Um, 
but that isn't the world we live in, <laughs> you know. And people are open to believe in what they want to believe in, you know? and and they and I do think they also they definitely serve a purpose for some people, for, yeah. not for some people. They are good for people. Some, you know, some people would be better off if they didn't. Or they'd be worse off if they didn't have religion in their life. I really, I really think that you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, can be a force for good. Um, yeah, and, and you're 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 absolutely right. And certainly in Somalia, it's been used as a you know as a as a particularly by Al Shabab. You know, the more extreme interpretations have been used. You know, as a as a force for uh, causing a lot of hurt and and a lot of death. Um, so so yeah, um, I agree with that. It is Alex Thompson. Uh, yeah, it is Alex Thompson. And um, what was his book called? I mean, the irony is that he's a big gay black guy, rugby player, you think. And and he went and studied Arabic in mm -hmm. Yemen. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's like not inconspicuous. <laughs> yeah, and he's uh, as bent as a nine bob note, that old expression. <laughs> he's a great guy. He was a good, he was a good interview, actually. Um, uh, I'm trying to look for the book, so I don't want to, because you might be interested in reading it. And it's called... Oh, this hero life. This okay. Hero. Yeah. He is modest. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's really fun. But, you know, friends of mine that have studied Arabic, you know, as I, as I mentioned, you know, because the Gulf, Gulf War One kicked off, we were very limited in where we could go in our uh, immersion year, as they call it, our yeah. second year. Um, but, a, but a few of my colleagues, friends, you know, they went to Yemen. And one, one guy in particular uh, who... who then subsequently joined the Scots Guards. Uh, absolutely loves Yemen. I mean, he is a he is a Yemeni expert. His name's James Spencer, um, and he spent a very long time amongst Yemenis in the mountains. He he just knows. Do, do you know what I mean? He knows the country inside out, back to front. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't understand what he says. When he talks to me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so why? So why did you write the book then? Why did you feel yeah, it was important so, to get the, get it down? So it, I mean, it's interesting. I so I, I'll just I'll just say this at the beginning. I I didn't. Is that Jazeera Beach. That that is south of Jazeera Beach. That's uh, that's okay. what we would call Brits cover, Bay, yeah. and it's actually a favourite bay of the U.S. Marine Corps. <laughs> Um, what I w what I would say is that um, I didn't start out by writing a book, and you, you, you might have heard this from from other people. Um, I, uh, I, you know, it was it was twenty eighteen, twenty nineteen, and I was doing a lot of travel, and I was actually doing travel in Africa as well. I'd been to Kenya uh, with a couple of my colleagues, had gone and met with. Um, you know, some of our customers are the KDF and uh, the Kenyan uh, National Intelligence Service as well. And um, uh, it was also at a time when my mum's dementia had got quite bad. And I was also reflecting as, as you know, how terrible it would be not to remember in the future mm. places that I'd gone to or I'd been to. And I just, I, I suppose, not not for anyone to read, not for anyone to read. I just started to make notes, you know. Then the the notes section, you know, of the iPhone is quite helpful. <laughs> I just started to make notes of things. Do, do you know what I mean? And then I ended up making quite a lot of notes. And um, it wasn't really until I suppose this summer that I thought, well you know, let's convert, you know, you know, notes become pages very, very quickly. And then suddenly I realized that I had over 20,000 words of pages of, of stuff. And um, I thought, what, what's a, you know, what's a positive thing that I could do with this material? You know, so I thought, well, I, I'll write, you know, I'll, I'll pu pull this book together with the intent of obviously trying to raise a bit of money for UNICEF, specifically for their East Africa campaign, um, which, you know, I know my mum would appreciate, you know. So, um, 
so yeah so that's kind of do you know what I mean that's the genesis of 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 really how it started and I got thinking a lot about Somalia <clears throat> in the 2019 time frame there was a terrible uh, al-shabaab attack uh, in the center of Mogadishu which killed over 500 people in one attack which if you think about it you know didn't really get a great deal of airtime uh, you know and and you just think at the you know that just in that one instant the mass loss of loss of life and you yet, compare that to what's been going on recently. Correct, absolutely. And the reaction to what's going on at the moment, and no reaction to that. This is one of the things I, I, I always it does frustrate me, and the, the lack of um, what's the how to put it the lack of care about what the fuck is going on in a lot of places in Africa, you know, Somalia yeah. inclu included, which are both either horrendous or amazing, opportunistic. Mm -hmm amazing or not you know that we could be just we could be much more involved with it in positive ways i think anyway sorry go on yeah so i i so i thought right okay um you know i i, I really want to do something positive you know this summer i really want to do something positive <laughs> with this material that i you know because again no one's read it i haven't shared it with anyone you know no one and uh, I just thought, what could I do with it? What what could I do that would be just, you know, just a positive, positive output? Also, you know, in sharing the information, I, I wanted to perhaps change perceptions a little bit because my perception of Somalia, I mean, I, again, I appreciate it, you know, the security situation on the ground, despite all of the advances that have been made by the Somali National Army and by the government, the intelligence service. <coughs> it's still a very complex environment, but I wanted to change perception about my experience of that country because it's it bears no relation in, in many ways to, to what we see on television, yeah? It's a very beautiful country um, and it's very, you know, it's very... Um, diverse in terms of uh, in terms of geography uh, as well so um so that you know that was the original intent and, and genesis of doing this um yeah no oh, it's cool it's um it's it's you know, probably a bit of a cath cathartic experience as well right getting it down the paper yeah, well, it's, I, it's I guess it probably prompted more memories that you thought you'd forgotten. That. Well, it's really funny you say that, and it's funny how the memory works. Because, um, as I as I said, you know, spending a lot of time, I suppose, flying about here, there, and everywhere. You know, I, I had it the other day. You know, I, um, we, we were with some friends, and we'd gone on a, you know, on a holiday to to Sharm el Sheikh, and I completely, I for, I couldn't re I couldn't recall any of the details. I mean, the the fact. I'd just been on a, do you know what I mean? A, I suppose on a transatlantic trip that the immediately before probably explains, but yeah, just, just starting to, I suppose, start writing things down just triggers, do you know what I mean? Triggers memory. I was able to kind of like recall all sorts of things, which, you know, I thought I'd forgotten. Yeah. So, uh, one last question on it. Why why is it called the la why have you called it the land of milk and camel milk and honey? Yeah, so it's a kind of a bit of a play of words, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> Go on. So obviously uh, you know, the the land of milk and honey, uh, is a sort of biblical reference. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But oh, um, camel milk and honey, but yeah. camel milk in particular, and I think camels are so important to Somali society and have been so important for many thousands of years. I mean you could argue that, you know, um, Somalia and, and just the Horn of Africa in, in general in terms of kind of like culture um, is um, I was going to say is Neolithic it's actually pre-Neolithic pre so when we say Neolithic we're talking four to 10,000 BC okay but Somali society may have actually been a lot older or the populations that lived in the Horn of Africa in, the, in what we call Somalia today may have been in existence before before then okay but they're the ones that domesticated the camel 
they're the ones that traded camels. Somali camels today are prized. Yeah, so um, understanding, if you if you like, the the culture around camels and the trade with camels is so important to understanding, I think, East Africa and Somalia in particular, but also its position relative to ancient Egypt or ancient Greece or the Roman Empire, um, all, all the way all the way through through history. Um, so yeah, um, so camels are really important. <laughs> <laughs> camels, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, camels are really important. Like it, like it. Well, it's been a pleasure talking. Um, is there anything we haven't covered that you wanted to cover? No, I think I think that's great. So thank you. Well, well in fact, no. Where can people get the book? Yeah, so it's available on on uh, Amazon. Yeah. So it is self published, but it's uh, this wonderful thing of uh, print on demand. Um, it's an ama amazing concept. But uh, but yeah, they can get it on uh, on on Amazon in the UK or Amazon in the US or Amazon in Australia as well as Blackwell's and Barnes and & Noble and I think a few other outlets as well. And the link is on your website, right? Yeah, correct, yeah. SteveTandercliffe.com. Yeah. Oh, well, SteveTandercliffe.com, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, no, it was a pleasure, it. My, my pleasure. Good, yeah, enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it too. Yeah, and it uh, thank fantastic. you to Dave Davis for uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the invitation. Uh, the yeah, invitation, cheers, Dave. The introduction. Yeah, cheers, Dave. <laughs> cheers, Dave. He will read your book. He will read your book. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, that people people who haven't watched the icebreaker will not know what we're talking about. <laughs> However, Dave will know. Dave, Steve's gonna read your book. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Cheers, thank you.